recording. Okay, so we are all uh, recorded now. Thank you all so much for attending our March Tamales meeting. Um, we were really grateful to have um, Antoinette Verdone for uh, last month's meetings to discuss um, both team ability as well as her work trying to get um, AT professionals connected with makers. And we're so excited to um, have um, Ken Hackbarth today, uh, turn the floor over to him to discuss um, his work with Volkswitch, as well as um, some of his most recent work around uh, AAC and generative AI. So that being said, I think Ken, I will go ahead and turn on over to you. All right. Um, so in preparing for this presentation, I didn't prepare much. <laughs> Uh, I I talked to Cole and said, well, you know, I could, what I think I would do is to tell you a little bit about what I have worked on, am working on, and basically start by taking you through the Volkswitch website, just so you know what kind of resources are there. And then spend the second half of this time uh, giving you a, a quick presentation of some work that I've, I've undertaken recently. Uh, as Cole said, uh, to look at the opportunities for revolutionizing uh, alternative and augmentative communication by leveraging uh, the power of generative artificial intelligence. Um, a little bit of my background, I, um, I have a master's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. Then, because that degree at the time was completely unmarketable, I uh, went out and got another degree in systems and industrial engineering. And I took that degree in, and um, spent about three decades with AT&T Bell Laboratories and uh, two, of, two of its divestitures, but always in product development. Um, then towards the end of that, I harkened back to something I always wanted to do, but thought there's no way I can make a living at this, which was um, supporting people with disabilities. And so what I did is I pursued a, a third master's in special education with a uh, specialization in assistive technology. And really what I've tended to do there is bring my engineering background uh, to that, to that uh, domain. Um, and so my, my master's project was very engineering oriented. It was kind of hard to find people who would, who would uh, consult on that uh, and act as my advisors, simply because it's basic, I had to actually go to the engineering department to get a professor from there to uh, co-support uh, me in that work. But <clears throat> then I fundamentally retired from the engineering work. And now I, in a retired uh, role, I spend over 40 hours a week working on this kind of stuff. Um, and everything I do is, is uh, public domain, no charge. It's just out there for people to use. Uh, I think what I say in other places, my goal for my work is to get it into the hands of as many people as possible. And one of the things I think that makes that uh, a real possibility is not charging for it. Uh, so it also makes it possible for me to do things and not worry about people coming back at me mad because they didn't pay for it in the first place, okay? Uh, you're not out any money. Uh, but generally, uh, I've just had a wonderful experience doing this and I expect to do it as long as I can add value. So the first thing I'm going to do is share and just take you quickly through the Volkswitch website. Um, so I created this website early in the process of doing this assistive technology design, DIY assistive technology design, mostly because I needed a place to put that work and describe that work so that um, in many cases, so that I didn't have to try and remember it, how things worked. I could just go back to the website and remind myself. But um, 
it also is a, then a, a great place for people to go and find these devices, build them themselves, and um, they don't have to they don't have to consult with me at all. Um, that's the other thing that I think is really important in this process is to get out of the middle of it, get out of the critical path for this. Uh, so create devices that people can build. They actually can do it. Regardless of their skill level, they can do it. Um, they don't have to develop any special skills. And I am have a very um, low bar for what is a special skill. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so I keep all my work here. Um, it's, there's a page devoted to the things that I've designed, um, things that I wanted to design from, from the start, but couldn't, several things, but couldn't find the tools to do it, uh, especially these key guards. When I started out, I investigated lots of CAD tools, but none of them fit the bill of being something that just a typical person, a non-technical person could use. Until I stumbled on uh, one particular tool called OpenSCAD, where I could do all the background work, of all the background computer-aided design work, uh, and then just expose a set of variables that anyone can come in, choose it, choose a value from a pull-down list, type, type some text into a text box, and that would automatically create the design for you. So it just required minimal liter liter literacy skills to design these devices. So just about everything on this web page is something that is customizable. Um, so yeah, I have several things that are key guard related. And then um, I stumbled into this concept of of uh, tactile symbols um, quite accidentally. That's how most of my work uh, comes into being is that there was a fortuitous event that happened. Uh, and I said, wow, that's that's how it's done? What? I can already think of better ways to do that. Um, and so I just start off on a, on a tangent and, and come up with something. Uh, with the key guards, with the uh, bliss tactile symbols, I made it a point to involve other people with way more domain expertise than I have. So uh, therapists, uh, AT providers, uh, individuals with disabilities, all those people were involved up front in the design and definition of these things, which they're what these people are doing is they're actually behind the definition of the designer itself, the tool itself. Um, and they point out where it falls short, where it needs to be enhanced. Uh, none of these things that you're seeing here are very rarely are any of these things that you see here solely my work. They often involve many other people. And Shannon uh, played an important role in these uh, tactile symbols. And she still is my most ardent evangelist for these. Um, I love evangelists because they often have access to audiences I don't have access to. And they often have credibility I will never have. So anyway, you can peruse these. Each one of these has one or more web pages. Some of them have tens of web pages associated with them. Uh, depending on how rich the customization may be. For people who are just getting started in 3D printing, I wanted to give them a place they could turn to just get started with some of the most important questions they may, they may need answers to. Um, and other resources. So each one of these, each one of these pages is rather short and then there are other topics introduced so you can just kind of step through all the topics here um let me see here this is one that i felt really important to include which is who can you turn to when you want to learn more about this domain of 3d printing 
people who really know what they're talking about, but can talk to an a regular audience. And um, so here are the five, there's this one, two, th three, four, five uh, YouTube, uh, what do they call them? YouTubers um, that I would send people to, to learn about it. People who know what they're talking about, people who aren't pushing a particular product, um, people who aren't speaking to the experts in, in the world, but really are trying to bring everyone up to speed. So again, that's another thing that you can uh, peruse yourself or just point people to if people have questions. I, uh, let's see, where's my, an example of that? I do have my opinions on 3D printing and, and I'm often asked, well, you've done a lot of 3D printing, what 3D printer should I get? So I put a stake in the ground here about what's important to consider, especially again, as a non-technical person. And I make my recommendations. I'm sure there are thousands of people who would disagree with me, but this is my website. This, um, I've been making assistive technology now for eight, nine years. And so I have, again, my opinions on what's important here. Um, and I try to touch on lots of topics, especially things like who is a maker and who isn't a maker. And uh, I draw a much larger circle around who can be a maker than most folks out there. And I think if you're thinking narrowly, you're making a mistake. But that's my opinion. So this this uh, this page is is uh, still a work in progress. I uh, have a couple more case studies that I want to add to it. And in fact, like every page on this website, it it's dynamic. As I learn more, I put everything I learn here. Um, I do present at conferences. <clears throat> I do uh, just meet with makers groups and sometimes present to them. I don't know if, if uh, Cole makes this one publicly available. I may point to this as well. But you can you can uh, come to this page and and uh, see old presentations that I've made uh, on various topics. I'll be presenting. I just found out today, Paul. I just found out today that I will be presenting at the TTAP conference. So glad to have you. Excited for it. Uh, so now I got to get serious and uh, put those presentations together. But they again, if they're available, they will also go here. And we uh, so Shannon and a couple of other uh, therapist types and myself, we. Uh, we made a uh, presentation at Closing the Gap. They asked if we could uh, write up an article for their for their magazine, and we did. This was, uh, I guess, a, about a year ago. And um, quite proud of that. I do have a Contact Us page. Another thing that I think is critical for anyone who is doing making is to give people a way to communicate with them before and after they attempt to make one of their devices. But um, I, just in general, I, in fact, I was thinking I need to expand the list of people that I would be interested in talking to, be interested in participating uh, in this work. Uh, what I'd love to, and these would all be volunteer people because I can't pay anybody. I don't have an income stream, but uh, I would love to find somebody who would be interested in cleaning up my website. Um, somebody who, so each of my devices has a full description of how to use it because they're customizable, full description of how to customize them. And so, the pages associated with them can get really dense and really long. 
And that can be intimidating. And I'm not even sure it's the best way to present the information. So having somebody who'd be real, especially, I would love to see people like literature and, and um, English majors get involved in this kind of work. Too often it's, it's thought of as, oh, you gotta be a technical person. You gotta be an engineer. No, engineers are really bad at certain things. One of them is communication. Um, so I would love to have people with those uh, liter literacy, um, writing, speaking kind of skills to um, help make this work better, to record videos uh, of how to use something, of how to assemble something. I try to do that all myself, but it it's a, a lot of work and it's out of date within a few months after I create it. And I just don't have the energy to go back and update that thing I created. So again, I think that people draw too narrow a circle around what it is or create too narrow a definition of what it is to be a maker. A collaborative set of people is the best maker that you can find. All right, so that's what the website is all about. That's the kind of thing I'm doing. I'm pretty much touching on all these devices uh, within every couple months because someone will come along and say, I need help with that. Or can, could you add a certain feature to that design? Um, recently, somebody came and said, you know, we have, we have this individual. We like the idea of your, your customizable head pointer, but that person needs two mounts for the pointer itself because they're using it in a way that requires more rigidity. They're using it to, to push a bocce ball or something like that. Um, and so that will that'll force me to go back to the original design, add that capability, add that to the user interface for customization, add that to the documentation. Those kind of things just pop up. Uh, un, un, it's unpredictable when those things will happen. But uh, I touch on just about everything within two, three months. And some things are just constant. All the key guard stuff is just constant. I love it because that means the people are actually trying to take advantage of these designs. They're not just sitting somewhere on a website or sitting somewhere on an obscure website where it's unlikely that anyone would find them. So I'm gonna stop here just in case there are any questions uh, about, about this part of the presentation. After that, I'm gonna move over into the what I'm currently uh, lost in. I mean, I did have one question I was gonna probably ask it at the end, but uh, Ken, your kind of your trajectory has been nothing but straightforward. And I was wondering folks going into kind of this space uh, what would you recommend to them so far as like, uh, would you, cause like, yeah, I bet you, if you could go back and change anything, you wouldn't, but for anyone that's starting new in the field, is there any recommendations you would give to them so far as uh, education or, uh, maybe outside of academia? So new into the field, uh, I, I'm thinking of this still as a volunteer field. So, um, Academia, I, I think you should do what it is you're good at, academic as well as anything else. So if, if, if like me, you think very spatially and technically, uh, then go with it. Uh, do what you're good at. Um, I have a whole book there behind me, wherever it is. That's devoted. It says, it says the the secret in life is not to try and address your weaknesses, but to focus on your strengths instead. In fact, I think it's strength builder is something that that's associated with it. But it, I had never considered that before. I'd always considered, oh gosh, I got to fill in, I got to address these weaknesses that I have. But no, if I'd spent more time uh, becoming better at the stuff that's just naturally easy for me. Um, 
And then realize that, that, that you're very narrow if you do that. And, and go ahead and live that life, okay? But bring in other people to supplement what you where you're weak, people whose strengths are in other places. Uh, like I said, I worked for three decades as, a, as an engineer at AT&T and Lucent and Avaya. These are all spinoffs. Um, I'll, and it was just part of the culture, though, that every effort was multi- was a multifunctional, multi-skilled. Uh, you, it was team-based. Uh, can both, Amanda ask a question? Okay. Can Can you hear me? Yeah, I Amanda can. Amanda asked a question. Do you, okay. Do you tend to specialize in a particular type of AT need? Example: mobility needs or motor skills. That's what you were asked. Okay. Um. So, I. I think I just have, I'm just naturally drawn to communication uh, thing, problems, issues. Um, I think that's where I was most drawn to this effort. It's also the safest place to be from a DIY assistive technology. Um, mobility, that's just fraught because you can end up attempting to design things where if they fail, someone could get hurt. In the area I'm working, that's way less likely. I mean, you, you can't even eat a key guard. So, um, so yeah. You have I guess, not seen some of the kids I've worked with. Well, they must have really great teeth. Um, I had I had a I had a student that literally chewed a case off because someone changed the voice on his dis, on his device. So uh, that hard rubber case was literally chewed to nothing. Okay. Well, I mean, he's trying to communicate. So. And he and he did. Somebody changed the voice, and he didn't like it. Yeah, and that's that's it's important that you're able to to communicate your dislikes as well as your likes. Um. Correct. Yeah, so I just, that's, I guess, let me see here. So we're going to make you an honorary speech path soon. Oh, well, um, you know, like I said, I got, I got three master's degrees. That makes me, uh, well, a master of three. And that's it. And nothing else. And only a master of those kind of <laughs> tangentially, to be honest. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so that that's where I specialize. Though I kind of do whatever gets me interested. So even the head pointer is still a communication related thing. Um, and I say I don't want to do mobility stuff, and I tell I really try to scare makers away from mobility things. But I have this itching need. To see if I could make a portable ramp or wheelchairs. And I'm going to proceed really, really slowly there and carefully and abandon it immediately if it looks like it's a problem. But boy, I just, it seems like such a need. So yeah, I, I guess I get, I get um, interested in just things that people bring up uh, in, in Facebook groups, in, uh, mailing lists and such. Yeah, let's see. Anything else here? I please, yeah, help me, Shanna, with anything I may be missing from the. I don't think we have uh, any other questions in the chat. Um, let's see here. Oh, so uh, Amanda just put um, the mobility issue with people getting hurt is a good point. We see far. Um, we so far have mostly done sensory toys because they're colorful and fun. And then earlier on in the chat. Um, Jay could put, you will hear especially economists refer to comparative advantage and absolute advantage. Great reading on this topic. So kind of going back to focusing in on strengths more so than uh, honing in on the weaknesses. So yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we, um, if nobody else has any other questions, I guess we are good to. Go I have one, and, one, oh, yes. one more question, Ken. Mm -hmm. where, where do you get most of your 
ideas to start with? What what ignites that initial idea that you get? Okay, so it can be really random, Shannon. Um, so uh, the idea of the six finger stylus, and I didn't even come up with that name. That was something that was sold on Amazon and probably other places. But it was there was somebody made a a comment in a Facebook group. I think it was the AT Makers something Facebook group about how they bought this thing, this thing from Amazon. It has a single um, a single ring and then a stylus attached to that ring. And that that stylus was constantly rotating on their fingers. And I thought, Man, that, yeah, I can see how that would that would happen all the time. And why would you pay twenty five dollars for something that you couldn't even get to to reliably stay in place on your hand. And so I thought, well, let me think about that for a while. Let me come up with something. And that led to a multi-ring design where, again, there's lots of flexibility on the size of the rings and the way the rings meet and the, and the, and the way the stylus was implemented uh, with conductive versus non-conductive things and whether you could wear it on your foot. As a, so they just kind of take off on their own from that, uh, the bliss tactile symbols. I don't know if you know this history, but I attended a a conference to talk about the key guards and 3D printing, and I got an email from a from a uh, an SLP who said, you know, we we're trying to print these these uh, tactile symbols from Project Core, and we're having a heck of a time printing them. And it turned out the design was broken, uh, and it couldn't be printed. And I thought, well, let me let me see first of all if I can if I can trim up that design so at least it can be printed. And then I thought when I looked at it, I said, I don't like these. I don't like these. I mean, I have enough background in in user interfaces that I know this is this is this is a really interesting idea. But there's got to be a better way than what they've done. And a couple of years worth of churning we end up with the bliss tactile symbols. So random, I'm telling you, random. Only the key guard stuff came um, from when I was in, when I was doing the master's degree and we would just touch on lots of topics. Um, the, the topic I'm gonna talk about next also happened during that period of time and a little bit before. I had ideas. A lot of a lot of things just came to me during the during that degree. Uh, I, I really learned to hate uh, graphic symbols, gra graph, uh, not gra those graphic images as a, a communication that go into communication devices. I learned to hate those during the pre during that master's degree because they seemed so arbitrary to me. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'll I'll jump right now into what. That that other presentation. All right. So, what I want to talk about here for the last half hour or so is the state of the art in augmented and alternative communication. And the question I have is: is is state of the art a grid? I mean, my key guards depend on them, but is that the state of the art? Is a virtual key guard or keyboard the state of the art? Really? I mean, my goodness. Um, so I like to think of the grid as building your thoughts one word at a time. Uh, you're, you have a fixed, limited vocabulary because you can only have so many words built into this. Uh, and to add more words, you have to add complexity to the navigation, uh, cognitive complexity too. It's difficult to, uh, to construct full sentences with you know, proper grammar, proper syntax, because you really are limited to, I know where these three words are to fundamentally get my, my meaning across. Virtual keyboards, as far as I'm concerned, you're building thoughts one character at a time. 
And sometimes you get a little boost by including word prediction in your work, but you're still building it one character at a time. Uh, with this kind of interface, you have access to an unlimited vocabulary. It's really limited only by your literacy. Uh, you have a few shortcuts beyond word, uh, beyond word for word prediction. Oh, yo, I'm sorry. There are few, very few shortcuts that you could take beyond uh, word prediction and some stored phrases you may have and stored phrases you could have with the other interface as well. Uh, proper grammar. It's really dependent on your literacy. Uh, and if you're willing to incur the cost and time of putting your thought together. This is a much slower interface than the uh, grid. Uh, what are academics currently working on? This is my opinion. People may, I would love to hear if anyone thinks ac academia is working on anything else. So here is an effort that's in, in the EU. So this is a, a um, Austrian uh, university, I believe. Uh, they're, they're looking to create a free open source web-based and customizable grid for AAC. And then Project Open, that's here in the US. It's got some big names associated with it. And they're aimed at, their aim is to improve in-person expressive. Uh, okay, so this is kind of mom and apple pie statement right here. Um, but it's fundamentally, they're trying to improve the grid. I went to a presentation by this group at um, ATIA when I was there a year ago. And it, I was surprised to find that they were focused really on tweaking the grid. So what kind of, uh, what's the navigation you could, you navigation techniques you could use to move more quickly through the grid? Uh, a recognition that, that AAC users spend a lot of time deleting what they just chose because they accidentally chose something they didn't want. So they were gonna make the delete key easier to get to, take up you know, more space, put it on both sides of the grid so you could, you could get to it either way. Uh, I was, again, really surprised that at this day and age, that's what, this, what, what all this brain power was focused on. And I said, I raised my hand and I thought, I said, so you're trying to improve conversational uh, speech. Have, do you guys have a model of conversation? Do you guys attempt to model conversation at all? And I didn't mean model in the sense of a thera therapist modeling for their student. I meant in the technical sense of creating a, uh, a logical representation of a concept. How would you, uh, how would you create a, a logical description of conversation itself? I could not communicate to them that, yeah, and I have looked at Bruce Baker's work. Uh, Bruce is trying to make things a little quicker, but he's still in the grid. Um, and I should say is, I know he died recently. Um, but anyway, I, I, I was just shocked that, that what they were trying to do was polish the grid and that nothing new was coming out. So I came across this article uh, recently, uh, Modeling Conversational Pragmatics. And this is modeling in the, well, it's probably the English version of the word model, but um, this is modeling in the technical sense. And they uh, reference other people in their article, but they break conversation and conversational goals into two pieces, into two types. One is transactional or ideational, where it's more important to accomplish, to the accomplishment of the external goal that the exchange, exchanged information is accurate than that it is transmitted without any delay. I believe that this is where grids are targeted, is this transactional communication. And so people are just trying to figure out more ways to get specific words that are relevant to this individual into their, into their um, the AC device so that they, that's there to, for them to choose and be clear, this is what I want. Um, then there's a whole nother category of communication. Uh, interactional or interpersonal, listener oriented rather than message or message oriented. And the precision of the message may be less important than the manner of its delivery, 
particularly its timeliness. And that's what I, I notice a lot when I've been in um, meetings with or, or in uh, communication with people using AC devices is that the communication, it's real time, it's face to face, it's or it's over a, a, a virtual interface, and it is very time limited. So how do these interfaces perform? Well, let's take a look first of all. In typical speech, uh, you produce anywhere between 100 and actually a little bit more than 100 to 180 words per, 180 words per minute. With grid-based apps, with row column scanning, 10 to 20 words per minute is the max. With virtual key keyboards, uh, it's less than five words a minute. So you can see that uh, these uh, two approaches are fall well short of what it would take to participate in typical speech. And then how do they perform otherwise? Uh, well, typical speech, you'll find people spend less than two seconds moving on to the next thing they're going to say. If they spend more than two seconds, there's, a, there's an awkwardness that builds up in the conversation where someone will feel the need, feel the need to fill that silence. Grid-based apps, this is just my observations. Uh, people, again, may disagree. But it seems to me like it takes at least 30 seconds, often more, to get that thought out. Uh, if someone's using a, a virtual key keyboard, it takes greater than a minute, often several minutes, to get that thought out. All the while, that awkwardness is building. Who do AEC users communicate with and under what conditions? I think they largely communicate with dedicated communication partners. And that communication is largely transaction-based. That's that first category. Um, if they communicate with strangers, like in a conference setting, they have prepared speeches that they're going to make. And they just kick off that prepared speech. What is the prevalent mode of communication in society? Uh, and what is the nature of that communication? Well, I think that is with strangers and acquaintances, not with dedicated communication partners. Uh, it's real time, it's face-to-face -face or phone-to-phone. -phone. There's a give and take and exchange of information. That's most of the communication. And it's very, extremely averse to awkward silences. So, what could be a new state of the art in AAC by leveraging generative artificial intelligence? Well, a very simple user interface where, where um, situational knowledge is built into the tool itself. Um, and I see Shannon says, that's why communication partner training is so important. Yes, however, in real life, if you wanna participate in society, you can't always be part, it can't always be communication with a trained partner. In fact, 99% of the time, the person you're meeting is not trained and you have to, you have to live in that society uh, it's very hard to change society. Uh, anyway, uh, so information like where am I? Who am I speaking to? What is it they just said specifically? And then can something support me in generating response options very quickly? High probability response options. We can talk about what that means, high probability where all I have to do is either tap directly on the response or um, step through those and then select the response. But again, I'm not building a response. I'm simply selecting a full whole cloth response with options to request more, with an op 
an option to request more of these proposals, and then simply to fall back and say, I want to use my standard. This isn't helping me. I'm not finding what I need. Let me generate my own response. So where would those reasonable response proposals come from? Well, I think large language models like ChatGPT are the perfect source. And again, give me the benefit of the doubt here for a moment. Um, so here's an example, if you've ever used ChatGPT before, uh, of, a, of an interaction with it, where you provide some input, some prompting, and it responds to your prompts. Well, here is an example. So Mark is a non-speaking individual. He's in the, in this case, in the middle of a communication, a communication exchange with uh, Tom. And Tom, um, so Mark has already said something to him. He ignore the fact that, well, how in the heck did that happen? Uh, but Tom says in response, yeah, I'm really beat. I had a long night last night. Now, we know some things about Mark and Tom. We could talk, we could talk about how in the heck do you know those? Uh, we know some things about their relationship. We know some things about uh, Tom. We know Mark some, knows some other things about Tom other than the fact that they have a relationship. Um, and he has some goals, several goals associated with his, with his relationship and any communication he might have relative to that relationship. So Tom's son plays basketball for his high school team. Mark would like to learn more about how Tom's son is doing. And then you just you make your request of ChatGPT after providing this context. Please suggest three possible brief responses for Mark to say. ChatGPT will return these in less than two seconds. And then, uh, and note that this is a language model that will give you rich content, excellent syntax, excellent grammar. And as, and with, you know, basically with at any level of, of, um, of communication you want. So you could, you could ask it to give you uh, the response in terms of what a six-year-old might say, what a second grader might say, uh, what someone would say if we were speaking Spanish rather than English, uh, and by a leap of imagination. Uh, provide me a pictorial representation using PCS graphics of how I might respond, if that's the more natural way for me to interpret these options. Okay, so here's one possible architecture, and I want to point you down here. So in, next month, th this article will be published in the um, Assistive Technology Outcomes and Benefits um, journal called Revolutionizing Augmentative and Alternative Communication with Generative Artificial Intelligence. I pulled this picture. This guy going here. I pulled this picture out of that document. I provide several other high level functional architectures. So calling on my um, engineering background. This is an architecture that puts all of the functionality on a, on an AAC device. There are other implementations that one could one could use here. Um, there are functional boxes that pull this off. All of them, by the way, wrapped in a data security and privacy layer, because your this information is going to be very personal to the person who's using the device. So the way that information would flow during a conversation is, first of all, information of situational awareness, information about the conversation itself. Where is it taking place? When, why, and with whom? So that's combined with the, um, the auditory information from this person that's, that you're communicating with. Uh, their speech is turned into text and combined with the situational uh, context, much like the prompts we saw earlier for ChatGPT, it's combined and mixed with 
uh, specific information about this user. Uh, what is their worldview? And the document goes into some depth on how you would capture someone's worldview. Uh, what are their relationships? Who are they in relationship with? What are their goals for that relationship? What are the likely goals for this communication? Uh, what is the history of their communication? That is, is put uh, bundled together and sent off to this box. And this is really a chat GPT large language model box where we ask for potential responses. Someone chooses among them and that then is communicated to the natural language processing component again to turn that text into speech for a particular selection. The purpose here, the intent here is to speak as someone, not for someone. So these little red arrows here are meant to uh, represent the offline communication that the user would have with their LLM and the representation of things like their worldview and uh, who they're in relationship with. So what the goal of this is to refine the internal weighting in the LLM so that that first response of the three or that first response of the five is most likely the one that they would have wanted to choose anyway. If it's not, every time that's not the case, the LLM is going to say, or this software is going to say, okay, I want to know why. Why didn't you like my first response? Or why didn't you like any of my responses? Tell me how I came up short. Because that feedback shapes the LLM itself. It is part of the training for the LLM. Um, there's initial training. It's, it's already a personalized LLM because it's already trained on what is this individual's worldview? Who are the people they might be in relationship with? These kinds of communications are they take place offline. Out of band is the technical term for it. They take, they take place in a setting where it's under the control of the user. So they, they, uh, they have complete control over the timing of it, the length of it, how, how uh, quickly things are um, are requested and responses are needed. It could even include simulated conversations. So we have a chance to sort of prep our conversation that we might have it uh, later on. Um, and, and again, you're, what you're doing is you're shaping this large language model to be more and more and more like you. Every time you give it this, you have one of these feedback sessions with it, it becomes more like you and can speak as you. And speak just means I give you some options here, but they're likely to be the kind of thing you would want to say. So this is a, it's more than just uh, something, a slide I put up. Here's a potential user interface. And by the way, user inter there could be a thousand different, well, not a thousand, a large number of user interfaces that sit on top of that that underlying architecture. Um, and you could choose among them or find one that's the most appropriate or, or uh, customize that user interface to fit your needs the best. Uh, so what you're gonna see here in a moment is a demo of well, how this would look. It's a user interface demo, which means it's all show. Um, there is no connection to some large language model here. There is no uh, super intelligent a um, uh, bit of logic running. Uh, and there, it's going to step through these potential responses. And if you click on this little switch here, it's going to be the, the equivalent of somebody uh, uh, pressing the switch in real life with some part of their body. The scenario is going to work like this. And it accompanies that image we just saw a second ago. Um, we're going to just, you have an opportunity to, to to um, create some set, or choose among some settings uh, for how the demo works. Then the scenario is you're an AAC user, you enter a Starbucks and that the location that you entered is recognized based on GPS. Maybe it's based on other, other pieces of information as well, like your calendar, who knows. Um, 
you move to the counter and a Starbucks employee greets you and asks for your order. Um, the system uh, tries to recognize who that individual is who you're, who's in conversation with you. Uh, it may, if it's a stranger, they may, it may not know who, who that is. But if it's someone you know, based on their voice, well then, and it's someone you're in a relationship with, well then that's new information that comes into, into uh, selecting potential responses. So based on the location, the speaker, the relationship with the speaker and the spoken prompt, the system is going to generate three candidate responses. While the system is working to determine what those responses should be, and while the user is selecting among them, some placeholder comments are going to be made. It's the same thing you would do when you're when you're standing at a counter and and you then they ask you, what do you want? You you don't immediately just come out with a statement. Most of us can't. What you do though is you you um, put a stake in the conversation and say, okay, I'm not, I haven't given up my my position here. I'm holding this with just a few kind of um, arbitrary statements that people make, like, ah, hmm, well, that's interesting. Uh, you have a large selection. Let me give me a second. All of these things are to say, don't come back at me yet. I'm choosing my response. So it does that. Uh, AAC user is going to choose one that will just do that uh, manually here. System is going to speak that response and the process would then continue. You can try out this demo yourself. Here's the URL for it. Um, but let's just go ahead and try it. Let's see, uh, do I have to turn off laser pointer in order to click on this? It looks like I do. So here are the settings. I want to make this much richer but I'm running into the limitations of my programming ability. So we'll start the scenario and you'll hear certain things spoken. Okay, we entered, it recognized you were at Starbucks. Welcome to Starbucks. What would you like to drink? There's the uh, voice to text. It tried to do... Um, hmm. Oh, now we're getting the placeholder statements I think hey whip me up a tall chocolate java mint frappuccino okay now this would continue waiting for a response from somebody um and that's that's about as far as this thing goes right now you can ask for more options but it doesn't get any more interesting at this point um Yeah, there could definitely be auditory clues. And as I, I mentioned earlier, it could even present this with graphic images rather than text to the user. Um, so where I wanted to go next with this was how would it handle if if the Ella, if the um, speech to text couldn't really translate the spoken words well, what would happen then? Uh, would that garbage in result in a bunch of garbage out by the by the LLM. How would it handle uncertainty on the prompting? So I went back to ChatGPT and said, let me let me think how I could make this a little harder on ChatGPT. So I uh, said, Mark responds with uh, chai latte. The Starbucks employee says, thank you. Would you lack anything else that would talk? So I said, please provide three responses for Mark to say. I want to see how it handles garbage, or at least a bit of garbage. Well, it surprised me. It was able to deal with the fact that it was it it wasn't perfect um, translation of of that speech into text representation. It went ahead and and figured out what it was the Starbucks employee actually said. So I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to have to challenge it even more. So I thought, let me let me make it really hard. And I said, the the Starbucks employee, sorry, the Starbucks employee actually said, thank you. What to buy? Can you pay? Otra mitas. Now, figure that one out. And as I read it back to myself, I said, I know talks like that. Boom, the gasser, then crash into my safe liver, then vanish. 
Yeah, Jar Jar Binks talks like that. So what is it going to do with that? Well, it's it said, okay, you looks like you want to be playful. Well, let me give you some playful responses. Uh, that may not be what you want to be at all. Uh, but boy, wouldn't it be fun to come back to that person and say, nah, just a chai latte, la, chai latte for me, danke. And even give them your best Jar Jar Binks. Um, this is a uh, concern I heard from the reviewers of the article. Doesn't this approach take away the voice of the user? I mean, uh, don't grids take away the voice of the user because they are limited in their vocabulary? Because if I have trouble navigating five screens to get to the word I want, I just give up. Well, remember that that LLM is initially personalized based on anything known about the user, including any written material, family and acquaintance, knowledge of family and acquaintances, personality tests, other things that would get at who this person is, what their worldview is, um, what their favorite books, movies, anything could be. Then it's regularly updated based on that interaction, those two orange arrows to refine those responses. The user fundamentally selects what it is they want. They are in complete control of whatever this thing is going to say. And the user can always fall back on their preferred grid or their preferred uh, virtual uh, keyboard as a last resort. And remember that any anytime the user chooses something other than the very first response, and again, there's there's not as much of a rush here because it's getting users getting these options really quickly. Anytime that they choose anything other than a first offered response, that's a heads up to the LLM that it needs to understand why, because it really wants to get better and better at predicting what it is you really would want to say in this situation. That's that, and that's that's what this uh, article is about. And I'll stop sharing. So, yeah, I um, this was something I, I that occurred to me a long time ago when I first heard about chatbots. Um, and it was a Radio Lab uh, podcast where they were talking about these chatbots over in Eastern Europe that men in America were getting romantically involved in, and. Uh, these then these the owners of those chatbots would find a way to take every penny these poor guys had. Uh, but I thought, boy, if it, if you can, could you use a chatbot to speak for no as someone? Could it be trained? And then what happened uh, a few a few uh, months ago? ChatGPT hit the scene, and it seemed like we are almost there. And every month, these large language models become more and more capable. So again, I'll open up for any questions. Uh, this is cool here. I think it's a really, really exciting opportunity for AC users because, I mean, when you think about it, like integrating AI and generative AI into the process, I think, would absolutely revolutionize how I think, the, especially just the rate of communication in general, because that is such a big barrier to, um, I guess, traditional means of communication and especially interacting with strangers. So I think that's, again, like utilizing the LM um, would be a fantastic opportunity um, if further evaluated. Can I put some comments in the chat also? Um, I'm getting kind of a broken signal out here in the middle of nowhere in Texas. And but, I, can, um, I can go ahead and uh, read the uh, comments out loud, Shannon, if you'd like. Thanks. Uh, so, so sorry. So let's see here. Um, I am going to start. Okay. So um, back a little while ago, Shannon said, we talked about communication competency as the ultimate goal for AC communicators, which is rarely completely achieved. Um, and then you would almost need quick choices for communication partners. So kind of going along the lines of, 
talking with communication partners or dedicated communication partners versus strangers. Um, so before you started, you would, you could, sorry, some of these are kind of um, related to different. Uh, yeah, some of them you answered in the um, text, but uh, yes. the biggest one would be the difference between um, children starting off learning language. And I, I think that there's a lot of really cool um, literacy programs that you could almost embed inter and intertwine with the communication system so that they have, like your typical child learns language through trial and error, like ba 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 ba, I'm babbling. And then um, when they hear mama, everybody assumes they're saying mama. And so you reinforce that. So there's got to be some way to kind of tie that natural language learning within the device for a very young child that's learning language that then emerges to literacy. So um, how you approach this as an adult with an acquired injury or an adult with a degenerative who already had language and how they approach learning a device and already have literacy is going to be different than um, teaching language literacy and a communication device all at once. So there could be some technology that could really facilitate that, I think. Right. And, and not quite for super young individuals, but, you know, the whole, whole ability of, of these LLMs like ChatGPT to summarize and simplify what what is being said and take it to whatever lexical level you want. Um, that would also mean that people who might be struggling at the with literacy can participate in conversations they otherwise would have difficulty with or follow conversations they might otherwise have difficulty with. Which is where that audit. Yeah. And some of them with they when they don't have the literacy, sometimes when you give them like the earbud with an auditory cue, like your choices are one is blank, 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 and they just have to choose a one, two or three, which many have those kinds they can choose that, or you could even tie it to a red, blue, green if they know color. But you also have to think about um, the progressive nature of language. So it's like many times when we buy a device for a child who's three, who comes in nonverbal, and then where their language is in second grade, they've got a device, they've got to keep that device growing with them for five years. Um, and so I think there's a lot of potential in learning with the child versus learning for the child, if that makes sense. Because a child coming into school doesn't already have literacy or language. And many times we get them at three with no language at all and we introduce a device. Um, and many times I think we shortchange kids because we don't move fast enough for them because we keep them on one or two selections. They get frustrated, it doesn't work for them and then we actually lose them before we get them. So I think there's some potential in here to be a little more intuitive with some of these language learners and literacy learners where it's actually building those skills, recognizing where they are, and then giving them the options based on where they are, but then it's not restricting them so that they can grow, if that makes sense. Yeah, the other thing that occurs to me, Shannon, is you have in this box a communication partner. Um, so the LLM already wants to know you better. Uh, and so the ability to kind of talk, communicate with you, have, have um, conversations that are at your speed. Right. A very patient communicator. Which is another reason why sometimes communication devices fail because it take maybe it takes five minutes for a child to respond. And by that time, the teacher's moved on to another child who's damaging something in the room. And that child doesn't recognize that their message was ever heard because somebody's gone by then, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, this would automatically then be able to at least put something up on a screen to wait a minute. That's a great point. Or something for the child to recognize that they did actually communicate something effectively. So I'm really, I'm really excited to see where this could go. The technology is there already to do many of these things. It's really just a, a job of connecting parts. Uh, so all of those things I talked right. about in that slide, those things already exist. This isn't, this isn't um, right. 
the art technology. Those things exist. We just have to wire them together. It's just an assembly, a technical assembly process. Uh, and as I say in the article, that also the beauty of this is even if you can't get all the pieces day one, the very first thing that comes out is already offering valuable functionality. Right. Right. Also, um, yeah, there's a lot that can be. I'm going to start ahead, There's a lot that can be built in. So, yeah, there's a lot that, that I, I think this is. I think this is a direction that a lot of the AAC needs to go. Um, and and I think we need to do better. So I think it's great information. And I'll back out now. Go um, ahead, Cole. Sorry, we also had one question in the chat from Will, um, which is, do you see any negative possibilities with chat GPT? Many people are worried that the technology is evolving too fast. So, um, yeah, so large language models, of which chat GPT is just one. They have... Um, generative artificial intelligence, of which ChatGPT is just one. Um, there, I certainly have concerns about that, especially when it comes to the non-pure language stuff. Uh, if if you're using generative AI to create deep fakes, which means things like I can make um, Joe Biden or Donald Trump say anything I want because all I need is three seconds of their communication, three seconds of their voice, and I can create uh, uh, believable uh, audio. Uh, I have, or the video aspects. If I can create a video that shows Joe Biden saying things or Donald Trump saying things, boy, we are not ready for that as a, as a species. Uh, and we are too easy to manipulate. That worries the heck out of me. Uh, this thing where I can choose, where we're basically working with language itself, which I believe also is the, that's the super strength of large language models, is that domain, not audio and not video, but just language itself. Um, I think there are fewer pitfalls there, you know, being able to generate propaganda easily, uh, that could be uh, written propaganda, but um Staying just staying in the in the in the the uh, world of words, that that I think is, is leveraging this technology to do the the most important stuff for for these people who really need help. Um, and and so I'm I often say you know yes uh, there are times when when uh, I, there are automated systems who present information to me for me to use. And I uh, I can either choose to use it or I can choose to wait and wait. And what is that word I'm really struggling for that I should put in my, in my text right now? Or I can just choose the response that it gave me. And often, and completely with my permission, because I do it, I go ahead and quickly choose the response it gave me because um, it is, it's close enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, what's important to me is keeping this conversation going, uh, strengthening the relationship. That's why I'm in communication here. Not because I wanna make sure that that person knows exactly what it was I was intending. Because at my age, it takes a while to find that word. Indeed. and. Thank you all so much again. Uh, thank you, Ken, for a terrific presentation. And it's just really great to kind of think about all these all these incredible things that can kind of ha happen um, or that, you know, hopefully AAC, AAC can trans transition to with the help of uh, generative AI. And just a heads up that our next uh, April meeting will be on uh, for second Tuesday, and I'm not 100% sure of the day right now. And we'll be tentatively having um, a representative from fab lab which is the fabrication laboratory out in el paso come to speak with us so we're very excited for that but thank you so much again uh ken for all your hard work with this presentation and it was really great to have this conversation